evening, everyone, and welcome to our very special uh, class, Digital Audio and Video 101 for Musicians. My name is Chris Whitaker, and I'm the music director of the Washington Heights Chamber Orchestra, also the music director of Fort Washington Collegiate Church. And let me stop my screen share here. Uh, and it is so good, uh, so good to see all of you this evening, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or here with us in the Zoom chat. Um, looks like we've got about 18 people and we'll keep letting more and more in. Um, you can feel free to uh, turn your camera on, uh, turn it off, whatever you like. We are uh, broadcasting this uh, live to our various channels, so just know that, um, but it's always fun to see your smiling faces, especially as we talk about uh, uh, something that can be as esoteric as, uh, as digital audio. So hello and welcome. Before we get started, I want to introduce uh, our special guest, uh, Miria Levia Gutierrez, who is the executive director of the Northern uh, Manhattan Arts Alliance, who is partnering uh, with us uh, to help share this program as an educational resource to uh, all Upper Manhattan artists. So please welcome Niria. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, Chris. I'm so happy to be here. Um, as Chris mentioned, I am the executive director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, better known as NOMA. Um, and for those of you who may not know who we are, we are an art service organization in Upper Manhattan. Um, and our job is to support artists and to support arts organizations. And we do this through exhibitions, through technical assistance and other programming. Um, and we especially love to work with partners um, like the wonderful Washington Heights Chamber Orchestra. Um, and we do that so that we can all solidify and promote the arts uptown. And I know that's something that we all share. Um, I'd love to invite you to visit our website at nomanyc.org um, and I'd like to invite you to a program we have tomorrow night that will probably be of interest to all of you. Um, this is our fourth in a series of conversations between um, Miguel Zenon, the renowned jazz musician, um, and uh, scientists uh, and, and they get together and they discuss the intersections between um, science and, and music and it's a really fantastic program tomorrow night be talking about learning um, musical diversity and that is in partnership with the Zuckerman Institute at Columbia University. So please come and if you don't come to our program tomorrow night we hope to see you at other programs that NOMA offers. Um, I'd like to encourage you all to ask questions tonight um, and I know the chat uh, function uh, is, is will be used uh, by, by Chris and so I encourage you to ask questions along the way. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and um, I'm happy to turn the mic back over to Chris. So we'll get going. Thank you so much, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nuria. I'm just replacing the spotlight. I think I would have more Zoom practice by now. Um, we're so glad you're all with us. So I'm going to be alternate, uh, alternating between sharing my screen and a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation that I put together uh, and also speaking to you here in my, um, in my apartment which has now become somewhat of a little recording studio. Um, so first, let's uh, just talk about the purpose of, uh, of this evening. Uh, here we go, share. So there is so much to know about the world of digital audio and video and there is so much more than we could even pretend to try and cover in about 90 minutes. Um, but the real purpose of this evening is to give you a framework to basically go out and build more knowledge on top of that framework, to hang it on that framework. Um, so I hope that you come away with a sense of a little bit more knowing what you don't know. Even in preparing for this evening, um, a lot of the things that I sort of know intuitively have been doing for a couple of years, um, I realized I don't really know the scientific information behind that, or I really need to go look this up and figure out what's the exact definition of this thing. So uh, the, I really went down a couple of my own rabbit holes just preparing for today. 
uh, for you all because I wanted to try make sure that the information I'm giving you is not just intuitively correct, but 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 uh, but accurate as well. And so I hope that you can use this um, to go out and do more research because there are um, there are so many um, excellent people. Um, who can speak very deeply on any number of the topics that we're going to cover tonight. And the second purpose uh, in this is to help you become a more collaborative and productive musical artist and citizen. And my purpose in um, sharing this presentation tonight has grown out of uh, almost a year now of um, working collaboratively with all kinds of artists and musicians from children and um, and amateurs um, to professionals. And um, I've, I've learned a, a, a lot along the way. I'm still learning every week. I learn new things. And there's kind of a, a, a this is the presentation of, I wish every musician had a basic understanding of these kinds of things so that even if they're not the ones who are producing this material, ultimately, if they're involved in the creation somehow, uh, this helps them to become uh, better, uh, better collaborators, better musical citizens. So that is the purpose of tonight. Many of you already know what the Washington Heights Chamber Orchestra is, but we are dedicated to presenting free and low cost concerts uh, to our upper Manhattan neighborhood. We are starting to reemerge from the pandemic um, to present streaming recitals and pop-up concerts coming in the spring. So this event tonight is just the first in a series that, uh, that we're launching. So without any more talking let's get to the to the slideshow i feel like uh yes i will accept questions as we as we go along uh my wife alexis is uh on the call and she is helping to channel questions so please write them in the chat um i think it's a small enough group we can probably interact a little bit as we go we'll see how that uh we'll see how that goes but um feel free to ask questions uh screen share here we go. So the first question is, what is sound? So um, again, this is something we all intuitively know, but it's worth at the outset saying, what is it that exactly we're, what is the thing that we're trying to capture and transform and share with the world? And uh, the, the simplest answer is that it's the, uh, it's the vibrations, it's the, the change in air pressure that goes from some kind of sound source, travels through the atmosphere, travels through the air, hits our eardrum, is transformed into a, a, a signal in our brain, and we perceive it as sound. Um, and so, whoop. ah, here we go. Ah. Um, and so the, 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 the graph at the bottom of the screen, you see um, a, a graphical representation of the most basic idea of a, of a sound wave, that it's a change in, in pressure, just like a, a wave in the ocean, um, that there's a, there's a peak and there's a valley. And that is an, that's an event that happens over time uh, as expressed at the bottom. You see it says, uh, uh, in this case, milliseconds. So as musicians, as artists, how do we talk about sound? We use descriptors like volume, like pitch, how high, how low. Uh, we talk about the timbre, the color, the quality of the sound. And you can think about what that entails. What is it that makes a trumpet sound different from a violin? Um, if they're both playing the note A, or A440, we'll talk about that more later, they're both playing the same fundamental pitch but we instantly recognize that a trumpet is a different, uh, has a different timbre than a violin. And so it's one of the, uh, one of the characteristics uh, of, the, of the sound is not just the fundamental note or fundamental pitch, but all of the overtones and all of the, uh, um, all of the other sounding pitches that are happening to color that, uh, that sound to create its quality. Right? It's how we differentiate between uh, our uh, uh, each other's voices. We can talk about the character of the attack, the sustain, and the release, or the life of the sound. Um, is there a sharp attack? Is there uh, a sort of, uh, uh, how is the sustain? Is it smooth? Is it jagged? Is the release uh, quick? Is it tapered? 
uh, things like that. And lastly, sort of most basic, uh, we can talk about sound in terms of its placement in space. And this becomes very real when we're talking about um, uh, stereo and panning uh, or, or a surround sound setup. So the next uh, set of concepts, and how do we measure these things? So everything I just talked about, we can measure volume uh, in decibels, which in this case is uh, is measured by, uh, or is indicated, represented by amplitude. So if we go back to this graph, this, uh, this graph of the rise and fall of the air pressure uh, is an indication of the, the sound wave's amplitude. The pitch, which we measure by frequency, which is uh, represented in hertz. Um, and uh, a lot of this is, is things that you know, but uh, we're sort of going to collect everybody's body of knowledge and, and, and take it up to the next level toward, toward digital audio. Um, but you would measure, uh, you know, for example, we, uh, A440 is 440 hertz. That's the, the peak and the valley and back again. It's 440 of those cycles in one second. Okay, so uh, the faster that, uh, that wave is moving, in, within the body of a second, the higher the pitch. The slower that that wave is moving uh, uh, relative to one second is lower in pitch. To talk about the quality or the timbre, we, we're, we're talking about the aggregate profile of all uh, of the sounding frequencies together. So uh, when I speak, there's a fundamental pitch that you hear as kind of the primary pitch but there's also this high. There's also this uh, this high frequency in my voice as well. In an instrument, uh, sometimes we work very hard to warm up the tone. What we're doing is we're uh, uh, we're bringing out more sort of midway mid range frequencies or uh, um, uh, uh, eliminating or, 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 or uh, muting rather dampening uh, more harsh upper frequencies. For example, so uh, we understand this idea of the quality of the sound uh, through the process of equalization, which we'll talk about. But you, you've, if you if you have any sound equipment from the '80s, which I had a lot at some point, uh, collecting from yard sales, you can sort of adjust each uh, um, group of uh, band of frequencies to adjust the quality of the sound: the low end, the high end, etc. Um, the idea of this attack sustained release is represented by something we call the sound envelope. And we'll look more at that later. Spatial placement uh, is a measure of the relative loudness across two or more sound sources. So um, the sound is not physically in, the, in one space or the other, it's louder in the left as opposed to the right. And so we experience it as being here on the left. Uh, more people coming in, awesome. So, how do we make these sound waves? We have uh, a diaphragm at either end of the sound wave. So when we sing into a microphone or make a sound that's picked up by a microphone, there is a, actually you can open it up. Here we go, I'm gonna, un, I'm gonna stop the share. There is, you can see, um, I don't know if I can take this off. It's, it's covered up, but basically there's a diaphragm inside of the microphone that as I create sound waves with my instrument, with my voice, is going to, now I can't get back on. That diaphragm is gonna vibrate sympathetically, hopefully very sympathetically with the, um, uh, with the air pressure that I'm putting out. And then the microphone is going to take that, those vibrations and turn them into electrical signals. Uh, travels through a cord and then on the other end, travels through preamp and mixer and processing and all these other things. On the other end, how is the sound, uh, uh, how does the sound come out to our ears? It's the opposite process where the electrical signal is uh, put through uh, a diaphragm, a magnet that, that moves according to the electrical signal and vibrates that diaphragm according to the frequencies you've created, and we get a speaker. 
to get the sound coming out the other end. So again, some of this is intuitive, but um, uh, hopefully it makes sense. So, but we're gonna jump into the deep end pretty quick. And, and this stuff is kind of fun. I'm, I'm learning more about this all the time. So we've looked at the graphic representation of a sound wave, uh, a measure of the, uh, the amplitude uh, in the peak and the, and the trowel across that axis over time. In the real world that we live in, there are more than 16 million colors. Uh, there is, you know, you can continue to zoom in on a point and until you get to, you know, sub atomic particles, there's always more in between. You can always go halfway there. It's, it, there's an infinite number of points on a line. It's the same thing with a sound wave. So when we're transferring a sound uh, source to a digital representation, we can't possibly capture every single point in that wave because there's an infinite number of points. And so the process of, uh, of recording something to a digital medium is sampling a specific number of points along that pattern. So I, I've just, uh, exported a, um, just a, 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 some file I was working on. I zoomed in, uh, uh, you can see the, the, time, uh, the time measurement at the top uh, is, is very short. So this is very, uh, very much zoomed in. And you can see on the side, uh, this, is a, um, this is a decibel reading, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But if you look closely, you can see these, oh, I can annotate this, look at this. This is incredible, thanks Zoom. Do you see these little dots that the program has actually uh, uh, shown us? So these dots are actually a representation. This is the data that the computer is actually recording. It's not recording every single point along this line. It's recording the points and then uh, it assumes the rest, it fills in the rest. It's, it's, really, it's really pretty neat. So what does that have to do with anything? Why do you need to know this? Let's see, how do I clear my annotation? Clear. As we'll find out later, the quality of your recording, the quality of your file is very dependent on how your music production system, your computer, your, 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 your program samples the audio that you're taking. So let's, let's talk about, uh, you can see on the side here, there's a, uh, there's a graph up and down here of, of decibels. And you see it goes from negative, it goes from negative infinity all the way up to, it's actually zero up here. It doesn't say it, but zero is at the top. So let's talk about decibels for a second. This is really interesting. Um, ah. So decibels as a measurement are relative and you'll hear them used in various situations, some of which I don't understand. There's a lot to know about this. You can talk about uh, decibels in a voltage context, in an electrical context. Um, out in nature, in, 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 in the, in the non-virtual, in the analog world, um, decibels are used to talk about the sound pressure level. It's still a relative measurement, but we have more of a sense of relative to uh, uh, the air at sea level where nothing's happening and uh, there's no disturbance in the, uh, in the air around you. Um, we have a, a measure of how many decibels various activities create. So uh, we consider zero decibels to be about the, the limit of human hearing. Whereas whispering, really quiet talking is around 30, you know, background office noise is about 50 decibels. Uh, you can see in this little chart here, uh, eventually the threshold of pain is about 130 and uh, jet engines is like 140 to 150 decibels. The interesting thing about decibels is it's not a linear system. It's a logarithmic um, 
system. So it, it, it rises exponentially. Now, so that's decibels in, 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 in the world, in the analog world, uh, where we're just walking around with a decibel measuring device and measuring the sound of fans and cats and jet engines and uh, construction. Now, when we're talking about decibels in digital sound, everything is relative. The computer doesn't know how loud we're experiencing something. All it understands is uh, uh, it's, it's, its relative amplitude uh, within that digital, that digital sample. So we'll, I'll show you more how this, how this works in a moment, but the thing to take away is zero is the limit. And most of the time we're working in negative numbers, negative 18, negative six, negative three. When we reach zero, that is, uh, it, it's kind of like, uh, I'll use a gardening analogy just to switch it up. It's kind of like the plant is now too big for the pot and you're gonna get distortion. So that point where the plant is too big for the pot is zero or where it's at its maximum capacity. So when we talk about decibels in a digital context, we use something called decibel full scale, um, where zero is uh, the threshold we don't wanna cross. As you can see on this, this is just like a, a, a cutaway from a soundboard. As you can see, it goes above zero uh, on these faders. Um, and you, know, you might say, well, why is that? If you're only supposed to go to zero, why, does it, why, does it, why doesn't it stop at zero? It's kind of like saying, well, your car goes up to 140 miles an hour. Why don't they just stop it at 65? There are cases where you're gonna push these faders above zero. But the idea is that uh, in, a, in the digital world, um, that uh, the, the, the amplitude can only reach a certain uh, uh, threshold relative to uh, the way that the sound is sampled, which I'm gonna show you. This will all become very practical soon, I promise. But it's kind of fun when it's uh, esoteric. So this is where we're going, the real stuff. Fidelity, how truthful is the sound that I'm, uh, is the recording of, of my sound? That's what we're all trying to get, right? We're trying to get a sound that is um, as truthful as possible, at least start there. And then if we wanna make it a little untrue and make it a little better, add a little reverb or a compression or pitch correction, sure. But we wanna start with, let me get it exactly how it sounds to my ear. So uh, there are two things that you need to know. And one is sample rate, and the other one is bit depth. In general, you're gonna to start to see this stuff everywhere if you're working with uh, audio and even in any kind of casual way. It's some of the stuff, uh, the things you need to know so that 5% that of the time when the car breaks down, you know what it is. 95% of the time, you're not gonna to need to worry about it because you're gonna be working in the right sample rates. But uh, uh, I have experienced uh, people who, who just don't, just, you know, when you go on to an audio program, there's so many options, they don't, they don't know what it is, and so they don't pay attention to it. It's something we need to know and pay attention to as, as artists and musicians. So um, the sample rate is, is how wide is the range of the frequencies that we can capture. So uh, as, as you see in the little graph here, um, human hearing is between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz generally. Um, over that, it's cats, dogs, animals, bats. Below that, it's elephants and black holes and who knows what. Um, so we don't really care so much about frequencies uh, beyond or below uh, 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz respectively. So sample rate is, uh, allows us to capture, uh, is, is what we are, uh, the container that we're using to capture the, the, the pitch, high and low. Uh, my violin plays between, you know, whatever it is, 500 hertz and 1500 hertz, but the overtones go all the way up to 1800 hertz. So I need a microphone, I need a system that's gonna capture all of those frequencies accurately with great fidelity. The other part of the spectrum is bit depth. And that is a measure of the dynamic range. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to make this a little plainer for you in a second and show you how this how this works. But basically, bit depth is like your um, is like your 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 pot for the plant. Um, how big a how big a tree can you grow, or how big a plant can you grow in this pot? And so, the deeper the pot, the bigger the plant. And so, when we just talked about um, uh, exceeding zero in our decibel full scale uh, range. Um, the greater the bit depth, the more room we have to work with, the more, um, think about um, a picture that is pixelated versus a picture that is um, very, very detailed. They could be of the exact same thing. You look at them and they maybe be the same physical size on your screen or in front of you, but one has so much more detail. You can zoom in and you can see all this detail on one of the pictures. The other one, you get the picture, you see what's going on, but it's a little bit pixelated. The closer you get to it, that's the analog that's the the analogous quality to bit depth in this case. Um, the the range of dynamics that those frequencies can exist in, uh, how high the amplitude can get within the sound the sound recording. Okay, let us. Okay, so this may answer some questions. And then maybe I'll stop for a moment. So um, let, let me talk about something kind of interesting. Uh, I, I sort of geeked out on this a little bit. Um, if you know nothing about digital sound and you go say and you learn the Nyquist uh, Shannon theorem, uh, that's hardcore. That's going to, people are going to be like, wow, you really know what you're talking about. So um, this, is the, this is the issue for, uh, for sampling, a, uh, sampling a waveform. Let me see if I can draw here. So notice this graphic. Uh, this person has, has put a point here. Uh, and actually, it should be a point here. All right. So the, 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 what we would call the period of this waveform is this long, peak to peak, right? This is the, this is the, this is the full. Um, uh, there's the smallest unit, I should say, of this waveform. Now, if we were to only sample the uh, only to sample the two peaks, we wouldn't have a data set from which we could extrapolate uh, where this uh, where this valley goes, where this trowel goes. So. Um, let's say that this, for, for a sake of argument, let's say that this waveform is, is, one, is one hertz. The Nyquist theorem uh, basically says that in order to accurately represent digitally this waveform, we have to have two points along this uh, this line. It need, the, the sample rate needs to be twice the highest frequency. So if we have if we have a if we have a, an, a let's let's say there's a theoretical instrument that only plays sounds at one hertz, and we want to get an accurate representation of that one hertz flute, we would need a sample rate of two hertz to make sure that we're sampling the peak and the trow along the way. Does that make sense? Give a Give a nod or a no. <laughs> if you want, I can, I can see your smiling faces a little bit. All that is to say, this is a little bit of the theoretical stuff, but all this is to say, look at some of these sample, uh, some sample sample rates. <laughs> Telephone, eight kilohertz. Voice over IP, 16 kilohertz. If you want to digitize AM radio accurately, you're looking at about 22 uh, uh, kilohertz. So you are all familiar with these um, with these qualities. The, tele the quality of a telephone call is not as good as a, a CD, right? The reason is is that the 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 data that's being sampled. And now I know that we're, we're telephone being digital, that's another conversation. But uh, for our purposes, uh, what's being sampled? Um, is a more limited representation of the sound. So you're not getting every high frequency. So let me see if I can, 
can show you. Uh, I was trying to get my whiteboard, but it didn't. Uh, it didn't work. So I'm going to. Um, I'm going to move my camera. See if I can do this. Bum, bum, bum. So here's your WAV file. And let's say that you have a uh, relatively sort of mid range. Wow, my pencil's broken. And then you have something that is fast. Maybe it's soft and fast, maybe it's loud and medium, and then it's slow, right? So the greater the bit depth, the wider the dynamic range, right? So think of it as uh, um, another way to think of it I have another graph that I'll show you that's, let's say that your bit depth is only four. One, two, three, four. That means the computer is only going to register one of those, uh, uh, one of those four measures of the amplitude. So all I've really got, I can draw this fancy wave, right? But all I've really got are, you know, point, 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 point. For example, whereas if my bit depth is really great, if I've got thousands of points from which to measure, that means that the, the, the relative dynamic uh, representation of the music is going to be so much more nuanced. It's a little scribbly, but you get the idea. So bit depth is that measure of amplitude, whereas uh, sample rate is Basically, how often is the computer taking a snapshot of where this, uh, where this, this waveform is in time? So let's say that here's my sample rate, or I'm sorry, here's my, here's my waveform going on. If I have a sample rate that, that matches the peaks and trials of that waveform, if it's a one, a one hertz, uh, waveform and I am sampling it twice for every period, I've accurately represented it. However, if I've got something more complicated going on, or, or rather using higher frequencies, right, that's going faster, and I'm only sampling it at a, a 2k sample rate, I'm missing all of the information in between. And our, our ears try and fill it in, but after a while, it just comes across as a loss in quality. And so that's why, that's why class, a telephone call sounds like crap, but your DVD sounds great because they are sampling it, sampling each second 96,000 times, as opposed to your phone call, which is only being sampled 8,000 times per second. So what's the takeaway from this? The takeaway is, um, when we're trying to produce something of professional quality, we're looking for 44.1 kilohertz sample rate or 48K. Going above 48K, um, what the, the Nyquist theorem shows us is that going above 48K really isn't that necessary because we would only need a really super high sample rate if we needed to get those really fast frequencies that are beyond human hearing. So a 48K sample rate is, um, is, is great if you've got music that go, if you've got sounds that reach 20, uh, 24, right? Half of that. Um, but when we get to 96, if we half 96, that would be the fastest frequency that's already above human hearing. So there are some, there's, there's a reason that, that people use these very, very high sample rates to try and, 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 and digitize the sound as faithfully as they can. But for the most part, it's not really something that we can hear. It's not something that's audible. Um, a lot of times people will work in higher sample rates and then they'll reduce it back down to 44.1 or 48. 
So like 48 is, um, is basically like what's broadcast on television. 44.1 is was decided as CD quality uh, some time ago. Let me go back to the screen share so you can see. Um, screen share. Right, and this is another fancy word, quant uh, quantization. You're picking points along that infinite, um, along that infinite, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't share this. Uh, you're picking points uh, along that infinite sine wave. Let's see what's next. Okay, so this is, this is um, I should have just gone to this. So uh, oversampling, you're taking all of these points uh, that you don't need because the computer is going to fill in, or the digital process is going to fill in uh, the journey from one point to the next. So, taking all of these excess, uh, sorry, taking all of these excess points along the the waveform doesn't really get you anything. Undersampling, you can see this this drawing uh, that's trying to represent undersampling, where uh, there are clearly peaks and trials that are not accounted for um, by where this uh, uh, by this sample rate in this, this little sketch, okay? Um, so let me show you bit depth, which can be a little confusing. So the important takeaway from sampling is that we wanna work in 44.1K. I could have just said, hey guys, work in 44.1K, but that wouldn't have filled an hour and a half. Um, work in 44.1K or 48K uh, kilohertz as your sample rate. Bit depth, we're generally working in 16-bit, 24-bit, maybe 32-bit, but just like a high sample rate goes beyond the necessities of human hearing, a high bit rate goes beyond the dynamic range that we need. So in practicalities, a 16-bit uh, 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 waveform can get us a volume uh, variation of 96 decibels from zero to 96. 24-bit is already up to 144 decibels. So we're already, this is, this is the, um, uh, the actual measurement of uh, the sound in nature. So already 144, like, yeah, if you wanna uh, hurt somebody, sure, sample it at 24-bit and crank it up all the way, you know, it, it, with, the, with the kind of system that could do that. But as you can see, once you get up to 64-bit, the dynamic range is just so dramatic that you don't need that range. You can live very comfortably within 16-bit and make perfectly dynamic music, capture the fluctuations of the, of the sound uh, and do it with great fidelity. Um, ah, takeaway. Uh, we're working in these two sample rates, 44.1 and 48, 16 or 24-bit depth. You might also see the, uh, the word bit rate out there. Uh, this gets conf super confusing, bit depth versus bit rate. But basically, bit rate is um, when you're using a compressed format. So uh, a compressed format like um, uh, MP3 or the iTunes AAC, um, the higher the bit rate, the less, uh, the less they've taken away, the less they've compressed. So that's, that's basically what, what you need to know about that. Uh, I hear there is a question. Who is it? Where is the thing here? Yes, that's a that is a great um, question. Uh, the question was, I think you can see in the chat, is can I show an example of where this comes up? Yes, I'm going to make this practical. Uh, very momentarily, we're going to look at some audio editing uh, together, and then you're going to see all this come together and go, oh, cool. Hopefully, um, let me see where we are in our. Okay. So I'm gonna go through the rest of the, uh, the uh, what I'm calling the, the capture side of this. And then we're gonna get into the software editing side. And that's where I'm gonna show you a lot of this stuff on the screen. So let's put a pin in, in sample rate, bit rate, and um, you'll see it uh, out, in, out in the wild shortly. So uh, some of you have asked in your your, your questions you asked before the, before the talk, which thank you so much for, uh, for all of your questions. There's some that I, I, uh, I will try to answer. Like I said, I hope that today provides enough of a framework that if I don't give you the direct answer, you at least have more knowledge about how, how to go and find the answer yourself. 
So here's the, um, uh, the chain essentially we're looking at. Um, with the second part in the chain, I think is, is the one that uh, I'd like to demystify the most. So we have a microphone, right? This is the diaphragm that's capturing the sound waves and turning them into an electrical signal. Then we have any number of devices. Uh, you may have heard of the term preamp or interface or mixer. Uh, the interface is a really popular, um, is a really popular thing that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's usually like a USB powered device uh, or it goes to the computer through USB, you plug a microphone or uh, uh, a quarter inch instrument cable into it and it goes, it acts as like a, a sound card essentially. Uh, a mixer can also provide the same, uh, the same effect. What we're doing is when a microphone records a signal, uh, or I'm sorry, when a microphone is, is picking up a signal, um, that signal is super weak. It's like minus 30 dB, I think. It's, it's very low. And so what the preamp essentially does is it gets the signal um, ready to uh, go into the next stage of the line, whether that's a mixer or into your, into your recorder. So um, the point is, is you can't just go from a nice, um, a nice professional microphone. Uh, you, you can't just go right into the computer. Now there's an exception to that that I'll talk about in a moment. But this is, a, this is a part of, those of you who are saying, what do I need to do to build a home studio? This is one of the key elements is finding an interface that works for you. We can talk a little bit more about that. Then you're going into your computer, your recorder, it's, the uh, data is being recorded on your hard drive. You're working with it in a, in a digital audio workstation, usually call it a DAW or a DAW. And then finally, we're monitoring the output through speakers that are sometimes powered by an actual amplifier. So you can see where there's the preamp and the amp or headphones, um, et cetera. Clear my drawings. All right. Um, let's see, let's go to the next. Aha, microphones. So this is my favorite. And um, there is so much to know about microphones, but these are the things you need to know. So there are a couple different types of microphones, fundamentally different types of microphones. Um, dynamic, condenser, and kind of a wild card called a ribbon mic, which has come, seems to have come back into fashion uh, a lot more recently. And someone actually asked me about it. So the differences between these microphones, you may see something like, uh, let me get out of, stop the share. You may see something like this. This is a Shure Beta 58. Uh, you might see a, a, a singer use something like this with, with, with some regularity. This is a dynamic mic. And um, it's not, it doesn't take any extra power. Um, yeah, actually, I'm just going to plug it in. Hold on a second. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, awesome. Great. Oh, look at this. Hands-on learning, hands-on for me, I guess. Um, so the thing about a dynamic mic that you need to know is that uh, it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. It's designed for uh, a, re a relatively loud sound source. Um, uh, it's not the most sensitive thing. And as you can hear, um, uh, it, um, you know, if I get really close to it, it doesn't sound very clear. It sounds kind of muffled. It sounds kind of poof, 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 right? So, but the farther away I get from it, uh, you're not going to hear me as well because it's really not designed to pick me up from far away, right? The idea is, the idea is it's not designed to pick me up from far away. It's designed to be within about an inch or three inches of the sound source. And so that, that sound source could be some rock star, you know, doing some crazy thing, right? And the mic's going to be able to take it. It's it's not going to blow out the, um, and that says, is that a 57? It's a Beta 58A, um, actually. But yeah, it's, it's exactly like a, a Shure 57, which is a really classic mic. Basically, these mics, you can beat the heck out of them, and they're fine, which is why they're, they're, um, they're beloved uh, <laughs> by people. So... Dynamic mics, good for live applications. If you're recording, um, I actually use them to record the piano. I use dynamic mics. 
And what that does is that it's mic'd very close inside the piano. Uh, you get the sound of the piano, but you don't get sound from the street. And that's kind of nice. Now there's some drawbacks to it too. It's not the most crystal clear, uh, uh, sensitive recording all the time, but it's also the piano, you know, when you put the mics right up against the strings, it's a very loud sound source. So the diaphragm can handle that level of air pressure is the point. See how this all sort of comes together a little bit? Now I'm gonna go back to, our can, whoops. I'm gonna go back to a condenser mic. Forgive me while I unplug this. Oh. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, awesome. So this is a Rode NT1, which is a really like, uh, I can put this in, Alexis can put this in the chat. Uh, you can see the Rode R-O-D-E, uh, famous microphone company. It's a very entry level um, condenser mic. It's not that expensive. I think it's 150, 200 bucks. Condenser mics are more expensive. They're more sensitive than dynamic mics. Um, you can, I don't know how it sounds over Zoom, frankly, but it might sound just a little bit clearer. Um, and I can talk from back here and it's actually not so bad. Uh, it's actually not so bad. And so uh, um, condenser mics are gonna be much more sensitive and uh, pick up a greater uh, dynamic range than a dynamic mic. Um, Ironically, the important thing to know about condenser mics when you're buying an interface is they use something called phantom power. And it's a really silly name. How many people have heard of phantom power? Few people. Okay. So you'll see it represented on your interface or on your mixer as plus 48 volts. And that's the voltage that it's sending to the mic. So the, um, uh, the electronics of the mic actually need to be powered to pick that up. Let me switch back to my uh, other thing, Mike. So uh, the third type of mic is a little bit, uh, it sort of straddles dynamic and condenser. It's called a ribbon mic. And it's, uh, it was, I think it was, it was developed in the 50s and 60s. It's got a really vintage uh, uh, warm sound. It picks up in a figure eight pattern, which I'll show you on the next page. Um, so Net asks, not all mixers have them, uh, certain amps. Most mixers are gonna have phantom power, but it's just something that you should know what it is. Um, and if you're gonna work with something like a ribbon mic, the important thing to know is, is that not all ribbon mics take phantom power and you can actually damage some microphones uh, running power through them. So again, the structure from which you can go and, and, and do more uh, deep knowledge. Uh, let, me, let me get back to screen share. I forget you can't see my other screen. Okay, so uh, dynamic, take a lot of abuse, close applications, condenser, uh, much more sensitive. Condenser mics are what we're gonna mostly record instrumental uh, music with. That's mostly what you see in the studio are condenser mics, maybe some fancy ribbon mics, but they're, um, they're relatively fragile. Uh, some of them are. So um, I, would not, if, I would not buy a ribbon mic as my first mic. I'd buy an entry-level condenser. Um, polar patterns. The other thing about microphones um, is that they have various polar pickup patterns. So what that means is uh, for example, this Shure microphone, uh, I will undo my screen share, has a, uh, has a, a, a cardioid pattern. And so it kind of looks like a little heart or a little mushroom, hence the, hence the cardioid for heart. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind as you're uh, looking at mics for various applications is what is the pickup pattern? Um, omnidirectional. It's very rare, unless you're going out you know, in a movie shoot or you, know, you need to pick up sound in all directions, you're probably not gonna get an omnidirectional, but um, you know, how far behind the microphone's diaphragm does the sound pick up? 
that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, so uh, dynamic condenser ribbon and what's the, uh, what's the pickup pattern? The ribbon mic is going to be where it says that figure eight down at the, the right side. Ribbon mics are those figure eight. So a lot of times if you use a ribbon mic, you're going to put an acoustic baffling behind one side of the mic so that it's not picking up what's coming off of the wall or some other person. Right? Unless you're singing a duet, I guess you can sing on either sides of the mic, but apparently people don't use them that much that way. Um, aha, okay. So now we have our microphone, now we're powering that signal. So uh, again, there's a, a couple different ways we can go. Um, there are tons of interfaces on the market. You can get interfaces for 75 bucks, 100 bucks, and it, and it can do just, just fine with what you need to. Um, basically what adds to the price, more bells and whistles, more channels. And so if you're recording just a single instrument, uh, you might really not need anything more than a channel or two. Uh, I just have a four channel mixer. Let's see if I can show you my interface. Uh, what I use uh, is sitting here on the printer. It's just, uh, I can zoom in the power. This is AV class, everybody. Look at this zooming. Uh, it's just a four channel mixer that, um, that goes out to USB. So that mixer takes the, uh, takes the role of powering the mics when I need it. I can adjust the volume or the gain on the mixer. I can do a little bit of uh, EQing um, and it sends it out. Now, uh, another thing that's really popular, especially if, uh, if you don't do a ton of recording, but you just wanna have something, there are lots of um, USB powered mics. So what you, what you have to understand is that the USB, uh, oops, the US, ah, stop the share. The USB element of the microphone is taking the role of the preamp. It's taking the role of the mixer, so to speak. And so it's providing that power to the mic. So um, what I think people might get confused about is like, why do I need a USB mic? Do I need an interface? Can I just pick up a Shure SM57 and plug it in? You can do some combination of all of those things. But the important thing is to know uh, that mics need power and the power needs to come from somewhere. Uh, and so whether that's a USB interface or it's uh, uh, a USB powered mic that's built in, for example, uh, Alexis has this great um, blue Yeti microphone. It's this kind of large thing over here on her desk, but it just goes directly to USB. It's a condenser mic that's powered. It's powered through, through USB port, um, but it doesn't need a separate preamp. It doesn't need a separate mixer. Um, I don't think you can even run it through a separate mixer, actually. So let's talk about, um, are there any questions for the moment about, um, uh, about microphones and, and interfaces? Any maybe general questions I can answer? Annette has a question. Um, here, I'll, I'll just unmute you, Annette. Hi. Nice to see you. You too. Good to see you. Uh, okay, a couple of questions. The USB mic, um, you would have to connect that because a lot of like interfaces, a lot of mixers don't have, uh, the older mixers don't have USB ports. Right. So, so um, it's a, um, right. So if you're going from, you can go from old school SM57s into a mixer from the 80s or the 90s. But what you're going to do is you're going to take your stereo out from that mixer and you're going to go into um, an interface that converts. You basically, you need to convert the analog, uh, analog signal into digital signal. And that's what, in this case, the, US, uh, the interface does that's connected to USB, the mixer that's connected to USB like my mixer, um, the, the Blue Yeti that goes right into that USB port, all those things are converting the analog signal into digital. So if you just have, if you have a 12 channel board or a 16 channel board and you wanna go into your computer, you can still do it. But what you need to do is get that, um, get that interface that converts the analog signal via your stereo out into a digital signal that then the computer accepts via USB. Make sense? And then Annette, it looks like you're talking. Do you have one more question? Click the mic. 
Um, my uh, so that's the thing because um, I have my interface. I have about three different mixers, and uh, I need to put a quarter inch to from the mixer to the analog to the in order to, to, for everything to go because I've been you know doing a lot of recording in my house and then you know some uh, other things that I've been doing uh, uh, some live Zoom stuff you know but um, that's the question like this the kind of hands down type of deal you know just like uh, because we all been doing it, you know, and it's it's everything seems it's it's all about doing it, really, what it comes down to. Yeah. Because I, you know, I mean, you brought back my electronic music class, and I was I was starting to you know get dizzy, but uh, <laughs> with the waves. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And so the uh, awesome. Well, we can we can talk more la later, Annette, on your specific thing. You and I can powwow about that. Okay. We can, we can figure that out. Um. Oh, sorry, I just muted you there. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, it, it, it's good to know what's under the hood with all this stuff because it seems really intimidating. But at the end of the day, we're just changing wave, we're just changing pressurized air from analog uh, to digital. Um, let's actually look at some editing software and uh, we'll, we'll hop on a little project and, and do some screwing around for a second. The video part of this is gonna go much faster, by the way, uh, partially because I know a lot less about video, but. Uh, so, um, so then we've taken the signal from the, uh, uh, from the microphone through the interface, uh, it's gotten its power, um, it's gotten its power and now we're headed to, uh, to the computer, to the software side of things. Just a snapshot of just a few of the audio editing software that is available. Um, Audacity, I, I use Adobe, uh, Audition and Adobe Premiere quite a bit, um, but Pro Tools, Logic, these are all really popular. Um, let's see where we going next. All right, so I am going to switch on over to, um, let's go to Adobe Audition for a second, and I'm gonna screen share. And the uh, person who asked the question about bit rate. So, um, more screen share. Okay. So there are many, many different programs that edit audio. Audacity is free, for example, um, but they all basically do the same thing. You're gonna find the same terminology uh, all over the place. So while some of this might look a little bit excessive, a little uh, too many bells and whistles, don't worry about it because it's, it's all the same principles underlying it. So um, I'm going to create a new audio file here. Okay, so when I actually go to create a new, a new audio file, it asks me for this, uh, uh, this information. It asks me directly for the sample rate. And you can see I can go all the way down to 6,000 or I can all go the way up to 192,000. So here it is right away. And so something that's important to know is if I'm collaborating with other people, uh, say we're each uh, gonna, re we're gonna, uh, we're each gonna play to a click track, we're gonna record our parts and then Jim's gonna stitch it together. Well, something to ask Jim is, Jim, what sample rate do you prefer? 48 or 41, uh, 44.1? Um, and I'm actually gonna do 44.1 for now. And I can see you can select the mono stereo 5.1 surround sound, which I'd never work with. Uh, but um, you know, most of the people watching my stuff are sitting on their laptops or watching on their phones and not using surround sound. And then you see here's the bit depth. And we have the option to go 16, 24, or 32. This program thinks it's really fancy. It wants to use 32, but we don't have to. It's not gonna, it's not gonna uh, increase the quality of the dynamic range that much. Uh, over our um, over our 16 bits, um, at least that we can hear. So I'm going to start this file. I'm going to, um, let's see, let me find something nice for us to look at. Um, <laughs> something I'm working on. I'm going to actually uh, work on some, show you guys some, some virtual ensemble stuff shortly. Let's hear a little bit of 
Um, uh, this is a vocalist I'm working with um, for a project. She's singing a spiritual, uh, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger. And so I've loaded this file into the, uh, into the editing program, I've copied it over. And now you can see that uh, the amplitude uh, only goes up to about minus 15. And relative to how, uh, where my speakers are set at, it's gonna be not that loud. Let's see if you guys can hear it. Uh. I'm just a poor welfare and stranger. Is that coming through a bit? So um, the first, I shouldn't say the first thing that I, I would do, but one, one thing that I might do is uh, um, if I'm, let's say that this is not a mix, I'm just manipulating it. If I wanna increase the volume. So you can see here, there's a little bit of, uh, there's a little dial that says, ah, I already did it. It says plus zero dB. So I can wind this back or I can wind it up. Now, if I wind it up too much, you see that the amplitude goes beyond, uh, so, some of the data disappears beyond the extremes of the amplitude. You see that? So now when this happens, when this happens, boys and girls, this is called clipping. This is what we don't want. So, uh, this is the, uh, one of the really important fundamental things about how we're recording is that when you're recording into um, a system, let's see if I can, um, let's bring back my blank file. Let me see if I can actually record while I'm talking to you. So, uh, will you do it? No, you don't have to do that, do that. So I'm telling it what to, what to, um, what to use, which is my, my USB audio uh, setup. So let's see if I can record something. Hello, hello, hello. So see here, it's recording at a relatively uh, low level per se. So now, um, one of the, the things that we need to do as we're recording is something called gain staging. And that means that we are um, uh, adjusting, um, the, the opening up the, 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 the faucet, so to speak, so that we get the most information we can and the le relative to the least noise. So if I zoom in, let's take like a, a, a spot that looks seemingly empty here. If I zoom in on this and I increase the volume, come on, don't prove me wrong here, bud. Do it. Look at all that. Look at all that garbage. Now I wasn't saying anything right, during that spot. This is noise. Let's see what, let's hear what it sounds like. I don't even know. Whoa, you hear that? So that's when we, 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 we blow up that silence. We raise the amplitude of that, quote, silence. What we're hearing is room noise. We're hearing electrical noise from the system. So every, everything has a, what we call a noise floor, right? Uh, hello, hello, hello. And then so you hear my voice. Here, so here's the problem. If I, I, so I don't like the volume of this. I said, I, it's, it's kind of soft. I want to raise it up. The problem is I'm not just raising my voice. I'm also raising the noise floor, okay? So if I add this volume here, I don't want to blast you out, so be careful. But so see here, so see here, it's recording. I need to do a longer stretch. Hold on a second. That doesn't help. Um, I don't know if this is gonna carry very well over Zoom because already the Zoom is adding things that we don't like. Uh, it's, Zoom is not, is not transferring the audio over 44.1 kilohertz per second. Zoom is transferring the audio over you know, 22 or something. Uh, so you can see, you see, the, you see the silence is being raised. So they say, well, what do I do then? Well. This is where the concept of gain staging comes in. So I'm just gonna delete all of this. I'm gonna to go to my, uh, just clear it all out. So it's empty. Uh, I'm gonna to go to my sound. My clip's falling off. I'm gonna bring you over to my soundboard. Ah. Here we go, see if I can carry this without. Can't go very far. So let's see. Yeah, actually, could you hold that? 
I'll just keep it on the mixer. So basically, the other principle I want to impart to you with gain staging is, all right, team. So working with sound is like following a torrent of water from the Hoover Dam to your faucet. So we are, yes, somebody says, is that what distortion is? Yes, that's exactly where we're going uh, with, with distortion. I actually haven't, I haven't played the distortion for you. We just heard the room noise, but we will get to distortion. So the microphone is going here in the top. There's a, there's a gain knob at the top of the mixer. Every single mixer uh, or interface is gonna have some kind of primary gain, right? And so this is like taking the dam to the local um, municipal water source, right? You've, 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 you've taken the torrent of, uh, uh, of Chris's uh, verbose, Chris's loud verbosity, and you've managed it down to this uh, municipal water station, which is this first level of gain. And then that channel, which is this row here is just a channel. Let's see if Alexis can get that, yeah. Then we have, uh, oftentimes you'll see a, a fader that goes up and down. This interface doesn't have that. It just has a level. So I can go down and go quieter. I can go up and probably now I'm a lot louder. I can't hear myself, but am I louder? Yes, right. So this is the, the sort of raw signal that I'm sending into the computer. So if I want to change the ratio of what we call signal to noise, I want more signal. So I'm gonna send the computer more signal uh, in this case. So watch what happens. I'm a little louder than I probably would normally be, but now let's go back to, you know, just set that down on the, yeah. Now let's go back to the screen share. And let's see what happens when I record now. Test, test, one, two, hello everyone. Now see that my, my level meter is actually going up in the yellow, right? What we want to try to avoid, let's see if I can get it to distort. So uh, turn your speakers down if I'm too loud. If I talk really loud, I'm getting up into the red. If I turn my gain up on top of the board, you can see now it's starting to, uh, it's starting to make a really harsh sound, right? And that is distortion, where the pot's too big for the plant, right? The, the, the system can't take it. And so in, Let's see what this sounds like. Top of the board, you can see now it's starting to, yeah, right? That sounds awful. But that's what we need to avoid. That's the devil. <laughs> that's, that's what we're all trying to get away from. So gain staging broadly is, is setting your gain levels basically from, from the Hoover Dam to the municipal water uh, source to your tap, setting it so that you've got a decent, what we call signal to noise ratio. There's a lot more to know about this. Um, and and lot people, a lot of people know a lot more than I do about this concept. Um, but that's the, that's the concept that we, 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 the first thing we're using when we're trying to get a good quality recording. So test, test, one, two, yeah, so hello everyone. Already you can, you can it's not, um, it, it's clipping in the interface before it even, it's actually not even clipping you see what, it's not clipping in the, in the system, it's actually clipping in the analog interface. So if I raise it even more, I can get it to clip even harder. Prepare yourself. Loud. If I talk really loud, I'm getting- Yeah, right, sorry, Annette. <laughs> That's what we're trying to avoid. And the problem is, folks, is that once you've recorded that, there's no undoing it. You, 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 you can't go in and change every, oh, let me just change this waveform, change this waveform in that way. If I, if I back off, well, actually in this case, in this case, it's, it, it, it hasn't changed the file, but if I exported this like this, and then were to re, as I send this to my buddy and say, hey, I recorded my part, and then he gets this, there's nothing he can do to fix it, basically. He can turn it down, but that quality of distortion is now embedded in the WAV file itself, okay? So let's go back to, uh, let's go back to the singer because she sounds so much better than I do. Um, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger. So I'm going to I'm going to give her a little bit more uh uh gain, a little bit a little bit louder, bring her up to where her 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 peaks are coming around minus 12. And then let's look at quality of sound for a second. So 
this would be uh, usually under uh, something like uh, effects in any given program. But most audio editing programs are going to have the equivalent of some kind of equalizer. And when I show you this, a lot of you, even if you haven't worked in the software before, you're going to recognize it from uh, from days of days of yore. Do you remember this? This this multi-band equalizer from back in the day. The great thing about sound is that all this stuff comes from the analog equivalent, you know, and so it's just translated into a, into a high tech computer medium. So I can, uh, as you see up here, this represents the frequency uh, profile uh, that I can manipulate. So I can add more high end, right? I'm raising the amplitude of just the band of frequencies that are around 22K, lowering the band that's around 2.8K. And so let's let's mess with it for a second. We can do it in real time. I'm just a poor wayfaring right, stranger so traveling through this world of woe. And there's no sickness, toil, no danger in that bright world to which I go. So if I want to make her sound like she's coming through a telephone, what am I doing? I'm getting rid of those high frequencies that are not going to be picked up in an 8K sample rate. Does that sort of make sense, how it all kind of comes together? So um, if you want something to sound a little bit more crisp and have a little bit more sort of, you want to hear the energy in the room, you, you might raise the high end a little bit. I might brighten her up ever so slightly. Oh, I'm going yeah, this, this may not translate over Zoom, I'm afraid. To see my father, I'm going there. But there you can hear, when I raise the high end, perhaps, what you hear is you hear more of, the, more of her, her mouth, basically. And so that gives us more of a sense of being there with her. This is just one way uh, of manipulating the sound. Um, another thing, uh, another concept that we don't have much time to get into is compression and limiting. Let me see, where did I? Ah, okay, uh, this is a graphic on gain staging. Everyone who's on this call, I'll send you this PowerPoint if that would be helpful. Um, you can see where this is illustrating the concept of the noise floor uh, and the idea of clipping, that you go sort of beyond the, the, the headroom of the, the file, in this case, what they call it. Um, I'm going to bounce ahead. Manipulating recorded audio. So we talked about gain, volume, normalizing is a way of bringing, bringing the peaks of something up to an, uh, a, a unified place. So all the peaks go up to zero or minus three or minus six. Equalization. Panning, taking the balance between left and right and adjusting that. Compression is where, uh, compression is where you basically you 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 change the um, you change the volume of the sound. You raise the lows and you lower the highs. So the the, the soft music gets louder. The loud music gets softer, and you, you compress it. And then the idea with that is once it's compressed, you can raise it up. So imagine that you're driving around. Maybe you've driven uh, uh, or ridden on the bus. Doesn't matter. You're trying to listen to a Mahler symphony. You have to keep cranking the volume knob, turning it up and down, because one minute it's like, blah, you know, all heck breaks loose. And then the other minute it's like super quiet. Well, the dynamic range of Mahler is really wide. But when you listen to a pop song on the radio, you don't, even if there's a soft part or a dynamic, it's kind of sensitive part, you don't need to do that. The reason is, is that the music has been uh, artificially compressed or limited so that the, uh, when the volume is low, the physical dynamics of the music are low, they've raised the amplitude so that the whole, the whole track has more of a uniform uh, sense of volume. Does that make sense? So compression is a, is a thing to, um, to explore for sure. Uh, it's a really important part of mixing. Um, and of course, reverb and delay, which a lot of you uh, already know all about that. So um, I want to speed through video and just show you some of this process for a few minutes of, of kind of how, how to put all these things together. Um, was it helpful to see the, the, the audio uh, software? So much you can do uh, with editing, editing that. Uh, but we're going to see a little bit more when we go into Adobe uh, Premiere in a moment. Um, so back to, the, back to the PowerPoint. So 
Similar thing with video. And I'm, I'm gonna speed through this because the takeaways are very simple. Um, how can we measure video quality? Frame rate and image size or, or resolution. Same exact analogous concept to audio. So frame rate is the, the number of frames that are taken per second. So a really low frame rate is probably something around 10 or 15. You imagine the days of the, you know, uh, cranking the, 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 the cartoon, the, the nickel, you know, show uh, watching like a horse move. The frame rate for that was very low because they drew the frames by hand, right? The principle is the same, is that uh, video is, is, is really nothing more than a whole bunch of images going really fast. And so the higher the frame rate, the more realistic it looks. Again, our eyes don't have a frame rate. Ah, sorry. Our eyes don't have a frame rate. It's, there's infinite number of points. But for something that's to be digital, um, we're taking snap, strategic snapshots. So what you need to know is that uh, working with multiple videos, uh, you have to be careful uh, to note if you're working with uh, cell phones have a way of spitting out different frame rates. Uh, you can have any frame rate you want. And cell phones, for the sake of compressing data, will have variable frame rates that change. And so I'm going to show you something in a momentarily uh, of how you sort of prepare media to be worked with uh, when you have um, multiple, let's say SIG is getting together a chorus. Shout out to SIG. Um, and SIG's chorus sends him 10 files and everybody's working in a different frame rate. That can be problematic. And so uh, I'll show you what we're gonna do about that. Then image size and resolution. You may have heard that you've seen these numbers, 1080. You see it as 1080p, the letter P. It's a, it's a high definition resolution that's actually 920 pixels uh, long, usually by uh, 1080 pixels high. That's what uh, is generally acknowledged as an industry standard, but now 4K uh, is, um, uh, is getting uh, to be much more widespread. But a, a, if you wanted something to be sent quickly over the internet, a smaller resolution or image size like 48 or 72 um, would, be, uh, would be totally apt. Um, so again, going very quickly, camcorder versus DSLR camera. The difference between your uh, camcorder and your DSLR camcorder is a, a, a more consumer grade. It can run continuously. DSLR is a more artistic uh, uh, instrument where you're going to be able to mess with the depth of focus. So you can have right now I'm, I'm watching, I'm, I'm recording on a camcorder. And so it's hopefully pretty clear behind me. But a DSLR camera, you can play with the lenses, you can um, play with the depth of field. And so it could focus in on me or it could focus behind me. That's the main difference uh, in a nutshell. Um, so if you're saying, what kind of camera should I get? A DSLR, a camcorder? Should I just use my cell phone? That's the starting place. Um, there's also something called a mirrorless uh, camera, which is basically a DSLR camera, uh, but the, the mechanics of it are a little bit different. It's worth, it's worth researching if you're gonna drop a few hundred bucks on a DSLR camera. Mirrorless cameras are the, uh, uh, seem to be the new thing. Um, the other thing about DSLR cameras is that they usually run for a shorter amount of time. So they may only run for 20 minutes or 30 minutes before you just stop and restart again. It's just the way they're designed. They're not always designed to do long. They're not designed to be plopped in the back of a lecture class for three hours, whereas camcorders can do that. Um, oh, and then we're back to audio. So uh, here's where we're going to uh, put some things together. So one of the, um, how about iPads? Yep, exactly, same thing as cell phones. Um, so when I create virtual uh, performances, the most important thing is the, the reference track or the click track. And I'm going to show you, you won't be able to hear it, unfortunately, um, because this program doesn't allow me to work over Zoom. But um, I just want to show you, this is a, a program called Cubase where I can, I, I can actually program, uh, synthesize a click track. Let me, let me show you this. So here you see uh, top file is called piano reference. We actually see waveform data. That's actually me playing the piano. I have another uh, channel called Cues. There's a tempo channel where I can actually change the, uh, the tempo of the piece. 
time signature. And then I have the click, which is basically, if you can see it just, for example. And this is something I think I sent to some jazz musicians. So as a conductor, I hate the fact that, you know, I don't get any power from waving my arms around uh, during the pandemic. It doesn't do me any good knowing how to wave. However, as someone who's organizing uh, a performance, the, the, the key thing to, uh, to consider when you're, when you're building a reference track, which you can even do with just your phone and the, 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 the voiceover technology, you record your bass track and then you sing over it or you give cues over it. The more specific you can be with entrances, cutoffs, reminding your ensemble, hey, smile, look at the camera, you know, uh, uh, hold the note out, one, two, three, off things like that, the more specific you can be in that reference track, the better this goes. And I can't tell you, it might seem like a real, yeah, sure, that sounds obvious. Trust me, it's not, uh, uh, it's a really key part of the process um, to making this go well, especially when you're working with um, uh, younger kids or, or, or people who aren't necessarily professional musicians. Um, no to all. Let's look at, um, where are we at here? I thought I had Premiere open, I'm sorry. So let's look at Adobe Premiere for just a second. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about how this comes together. Ah, let's see if I can get it to go. I... Bum, bum, bum. Um. Okay, so let's see. So very similar, uh, I think this is it. That's not it. Here we go. Uh, oh, here we go. So this is, a, uh, this is Adobe Premiere, which manipulates now not just audio, but video, and it does it all together. And so I just want to show you a little bit about the, the process of how how people make these virtual videos. Um, maybe something you want to try yourself, or at least you, know, you, can, you can know the process so that you can be a more effective collaborator. So um, each of these, there's a top half and a bottom half. The top half is video. The bottom half is audio. And the channels, actually, they're not linked. I unlinked them, but I'll, I'll, I'll relink. These channels are linked like this. So I have a couple tracks of drums. And then when we click on these various people, they would be linked to, so for example, I've relinked the piano. When I move this around on the timeline, the audio track is mixed or is, uh, is, is linked to the video track. So if I just solo the, uh, let's see if I can just play myself here. So, uh, so you just hear my audio but you see everyone else's video. I can hide them here. So, um, so in this case, all of these folks have listened, are listening to a track that I created that I'm singing along with. It's got a little click. It's got my piano. It's got my voice literally singing the tenor, the soprano alto part. And they're singing along with me while they film themselves. So they're, they're listening to a track that's maybe playing off of another phone or a, um, uh, or a laptop and they're recording themselves. So I just hear their voice. Let me, let me just play a little bit of it. This is actually something we did at, at my, for my church uh, this morning. Let's see if it plays okay. Um, I, I, I made myself out of sync, didn't I? Oh, my words, before they're said, you know my needs, and I am fair. You give me life. You so, um, I know that this is my ways. I know that this is my strength, well. my path for all my days. My strength, my path. It takes a lot of computing power. It takes it a second. So um, hopefully you got just a taste. People are singing together. They are on screen together. They are grooving together. I have tons of these 
uh, in various places. So if you want, want to watch more, I can, I can uh, lead you to it. But I, I just want to show you what, when you see these things, what's happening on the back end is, in this case, it's not, a, it's not some app. It's not, um, uh, it's, it's not some service that magically does this. Literally, I've taken this guy's video that he sent to me through his cell phone. I've adjusted the size. I've, I've applied a crop uh, effect to it so that basically I try to get all their heads to be the same size. I, I've lined him up. Uh, and the way that I line him up, ah, this is why you need two monitors to use this program. There's too much stuff going on. The way that I've lined people up is if I scroll down here, this is the, these are the choir parts. Now look how neat this is. Now that you understand sort of what you're looking at, the amplitude, uh, you can see that the peaks and the, 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 the trowels are, are, are the same, right? And so I'm using their audio to line this up initially. And so let's see um, if I solo Julie and Stephanie here for a second. It's gonna take a minute. My strength, my path for all my days. So I've actually used the audio. If I should fly beyond the dawn, the darkness will not overcome. If I love. I know. Um, so you can hear that it's that um, it's, it's hard to stop the thing that uses a lot of computer, computing power. You're using the audio information to visually line them up and then hear it and decide, you know, is this 100% aligned? Was this person feeling the beat this way? How are they doing this? You know, and it, it builds from there. So what ends up happening when you get a group of, um, let me see if I can uh, find something for us real quick. I know we're running out of time. Um, when you get, oh, I have a great one. Let's see. Uh, just for a moment, I'm going to show you just a screenshot of uh, something I'm working on. Um, basically, oh, don't do this. Can you actually pause? There we go. All right. So here's the here's one of the projects I'm working on. It's at some point it's 140 kids, and the way that we build this is we actually build. Uh, we build nested videos. So we're building, so at any one time, um, you're building a group of you know, 15 kids. And then you take that video and you nest it into a larger video. And so when you're, when you're seeing some of these really epic um, virtual videos, you're seeing uh, uh, maybe, maybe even smaller groups, like groups of five, groups of six. And then they, that group of six is exported and then it's added on to uh, a bigger and bigger group until finally the computer, there's no way that the computer can really handle 140 uh, channel mix. It's a little bit excessive. So you kind of do it in pieces. So it's a little bit of the process. Um, let me get out of this. Uh, something I'm working on. So let's go to a sec. I want to show you sort of the end of uh, the process to get back to uh, something that's important. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to show you one more thing before I show you the, the end of the process. So um, this is important. So let's see, this week, um, maybe I deleted it. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. So I got my video files from individuals. Now, they're all recorded on cell phones maybe different cameras. Maybe they recorded it on, on a nice camera. I don't know. I go to properties. Let's look at the details of the properties because you can see this. Um, we actually have frame width 9220 by 1088. Interesting, right? So it's so a non-standard frame height. It's not 1080, it's 1088 according to this. And here it's 24 frames per second. That's interesting. You see the audio sample rate was 44.1 on this person's phone. That's That's cool. Let's see what what hers is. So I go to details. Here she's recorded at uh, 
let's see, 29.97 frames a second, which is where I'm working. But she's working at an audio sample rate of 48 kilohertz. Um, oh yeah, oh, she, she's working at 9, 1920 by 1080. So you can see how if you're trying to, if you're trying to work with uh, 140 people, which that might not be your first project, but let's say you're just working with three or four. One of the things that you want to do is you want to unify these rates. And so there's a, an encoding program that uh, you will recognize by the wonderful, um, the wonderful pineapple icon. I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's called Handbrake. And Alexis will put it in the chat. So what you do is I'll take a pile of these videos. I'll take the entire folder. I'll drag them into this program called Handbrake. I really don't need it to do all of those. Anyway, let's just have it do one. So basically what I can do is I can go in and I can quickly, relatively quickly encode a bunch of different, re-encode a bunch of different files. So let's say I have frame rates of 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second, 24 frames per second. The computer doesn't like it when you're throwing a bunch of different frame rates at it at the same time. It's not gonna be happy and you're not gonna be happy because you're gonna be sitting there for many more hours than you need to. So it's best if when you're lining up these different videos, if you're using similar frame rates, it's too much to ask to have everyone figure out how to, how to unify their frame rates. You have to do it for them. And so um, here in this case, you can see that all these different, uh, these different presets, um, which you can explore. I've built a custom one that uses, let's see if there's exactly, right? So it's using 29.9 second frames a second, uh, which is, television standard. You sometimes hear it called 30 frames per second, but it's actually 29.97 frames per second. So that's where I'm working in. And I'm working with a constant frame rate, not just a, a peak frame rate, which is where the, 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 the phone will variably, will use different frame rates um, as part of its compression. So I wanted to, again, uh, just, just a piece of the puzzle that this is a thing that you need to be concerned with in the digital world, things like frame rates, things like resolution size. So we get to the end of the process. Uh, oh, Deborah has a question. Uh, did you she also advise separate audio tracks for one audio? Oh, so that's a great question. Thank you for that. So mm -hmm. let me show. Uh, so the question is, uh, do you advise uh, separate did, uh, separate audio from video? Yes, absolutely. So I, I, I neglected to say this. So my piano, uh, in this case. Let me see if I can show it to you real quick. Um, let me just start a new thing here. Uh, I just need a new sequence. So I'll show you this. When I go to start a new sequence, um, and again, any video editing program is gonna have something similar. It allows me all these, well, I could do 1080 at 24 frames per second, 25, 30, 50, right? And here, their definition of 30 is actually 29.97. It's kind of, uh, Kind of pedantic, right? So I'm going to start this new sequence one. Let me see if I can. I know this is a lot to look at, but again, it's the principle. Uh, so let me show you. So I actually recorded, if you can see, I recorded a, a movie. And then I, I, at the same time, I recorded on my camera, which I have a DSLR camera. Um, I recorded good quality audio. So um, I just kind of eyeballed it there, but what I can do is I can zoom in and so sometimes the program will actually sync this up for you if the audio data is close enough, but see how I'm moving this uh, at a very, I can zoom in really, really far and it gets to be a much to look at, but I'm moving it by, by basically a frame here. And so um, you can hear the, 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 the camera audio is lousy. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the difference over Zoom, but basically I'm gonna substitute that recorded audio. I'm gonna unlink this, get rid of it, and then uh, replace it. Now, another step in this process um, that may be built into your program, it may be a separate thing that you do in a different audio software. You can see that uh, Audition actually has a, a sound mixer built in. So we have our master out over here and then we have our various channels that we add. So I might decide that 
uh, I'd like to EQ the piano a little bit. So here I can, I can add effects. Um, I'm going to add a, just like, just like what I was doing in audition, here's my, here's my equalizer, for example, or here's where I add my reverb or my compressor. Okay. Um, a lot that we could, we could talk about. Um, but it's again, that, that, um, that flow from, you've got the, the, the water going into the dam, uh, you manipulate it here, and then you're, 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 you're tweaking it, you're tweaking it here. And uh, the idea is that you don't have to bring these faders up to, you're not cranking it up to 15. You're, you're, you're trying to get it not to, uh, to stay from clipping. So you're keeping things below zero, uh, essentially. Any other questions in that spot yet? Feel free to ask them. I'll stay on for, for, for a little longer to, to answer questions. The last part of this process uh, then, let's go back to the, the choir, so I'll load. Um, can we see them? Yeah, here we go. So here they are. Now it's time to actually export this. So uh, just like we saw in the video edit, or I'm sorry, the audio editing program, uh, where's my window? Here it is. So just like we saw in the audio editing program, there are, you can't see that? Oh, there it is, there it is, there it is, it's just slow. Um, there are settings, and this is where there is a ton to know, but um, you can see, so it says match sequence settings, uh, or in this case, I, I wanna use a very specific format, or what we sometimes call codec. Um, and as you can see, there are a bunch of different options, MPEG-4, uh, QuickTime. If I was just doing an audio export, I could export it as an MP3. So once I have my, uh, the, the, the industry standards right now are this H.264. Um, maybe you can write that in the chat, Alexis. And also H.265, which is better. These are, these are basically compression rates that um, uh, YouTube, Facebook are all, um, uh, are all jiving with. But inside of that uh, codec, there's all kinds of options uh, if I want to convert, convert this down to a, a, a Vimeo file, something that's compatible with Vimeo at, at 40, uh, 4, 480p. So it's actually gonna make the quality a little lower. It's gonna lower the resolution. It was like it exported as a uh, um, you know, high quality uh, 1080p. Everything is recorded here in, in most of it's in 1080p. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go higher than that. I wouldn't export this in 4K because it won't add, it won't make it look nicer. It's just gonna be bigger basically. So um, here I'm just gonna say match source high bit rate. But then you can see in the summary, it's showing, okay, this is 20, 29.7, I'm sorry, 29.97 frames per second. Um, some various other specs that you'll get to know as you do this. And then this is the audio, 48,000 uh, Hertz, which I can go down and say, well, I don't really care if it's 48,000 Hertz. I'd like to, 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 to just export it at 44.1 Hertz, for example. So this stuff all starts to come together um, in that way. But the, um, the, the, the key things I want you to understand are the whole point of this is, let me, let me come back to, let me come back to spotlighting me. What I want you to take away is the whole point of this along the way is to capture audio and video that is the most like, like, uh, lifelike and has the highest fidelity. You don't want to lose any of that fidelity along the way as, as, as much as your, your budget and your equipment allows it. And so from the, um, from the, way, that you, um, the way that you capture, the kind of microphone you use, the placement of that mic, the, uh, the interface, how you uh, how you you adjust the gain and this, the the gain staging like damming the river, and then getting it out to that uh, that trickle where you can manip manipulate it, set it up the best way to be manipulated, and add reverb and EQ and etc. Um, same thing with the uh, uh, with the camera, understanding frame rates that this is uh, uh, um, uh, one way that affects the quality, 
the resolution, whether or not it's detailed or whether it's a small file size that you, you, you don't need a lot of detail, like a 480, 480p, for example. Um, it's about knowing all the things along the way that you need to be concerned about as you want to create something that looks and sounds the best that it can be. And as I said in the beginning, this is, as you can start to see, this is really just scratching the surface um, for, uh, uh, for all that there is, um, all that there is to know um, about digital audio and video. And I, I, I'm learning things every day. I'm learning things every week, new things. Of, oh my gosh, I didn't know the program did that. Or, oh, I didn't know. I really don't understand what a decibel is. Like I was learning those things uh, uh, in, in preparation for this talk. So um, I hope that if anything, uh, this makes this world a little bit less intimidating, that uh, sometimes it just seems like there's so much technology out there. There's so many options. At the end of the day, there's not really that many options. There's just kind of like a couple of things that everybody's trying to do well. And um, uh, uh, if, you, if you know what you're, what you're uh, if you have a structure on which to hang that knowledge, um, type of microphone, uh, sample rates, uh, understanding gain, um, then really it's uh, uh, really just a matter of refining and, and learning more to hang on to that, that structure. Um, but um, you can you can do it, and uh, you can. Alexis Alexis is laughing over there. She's yeah, you can do it. You can do it, and I I, I hope that this uh, talk, as much as I threw some theoretical concepts at, at you, um, helps to demystify a little bit of this world, um, so that we can all uh, um, that we we can all go out and and share the great art. That, that you all are, are already doing. So um, with that, I'll be quiet. Uh, if there are any uh, questions, I'll take some questions um, before we go. I, I don't, I'm not in a rush, I'm not going anywhere. So um, if you'd like to, uh, to sign off, uh, maybe I'll end, I'll, end the, uh, I'll end the screen share, I'm sorry, the, uh, the recording, uh, the stop the live stream, uh, but I'll stick around for some questions. And we can we can unmute ourselves. So to those watching on Facebook and YouTube, so 